Hey there, let me show how to debug a crashed Rust application using WinDebug. So, I have been working on a Rust application for some time and I found very little reason to actually use WinDebug. The reason is that the language can check for a lot of errors during compilation. However, if you do happen to crash an application, you can actually use a lot of techniques to debug, including WinDebug. For this demo, I did not really write an application that crashes naturally. So let's simulate debugging by using an asset that does halt a Rust application. Let me switch over to Visual Studio Code, which has some source code of a Rust application. This application does nothing. All it has is a main and a single function. The purpose is to show what happens when a Rust application crashes. In this case, I'm using an asset on line 26 here to simulate a crash. Building a sample application that crashed was too convoluted and I felt that that was betraying the essence of why Rust was used in the first place. The reason is that Rust actually checks for a lot of errors during compile. Let me show you. If I run cargo build, I would get that the build process fails because one of the lines is actually an error. It says here that line 21 is actually an error because it is attempting to divide by 0. Which is actually true, line 20 and 21 is actually attempting to divide by 0. This is the core reason why Rust generally doesn't crash. Because during compile, it can check a lot of errors. And when the checks turn out that there is an error, the compilation fails. Now, if I want to proceed to build, I have to actually comment out the code. Let me do that right now. If I comment out the code and do a build, this time it actually builds. It gives a warning because I have an additional line on the top. Uh, that doesn't really matter. But now if I run the application with cargo run, the application is actually going to crash. And that's because it's going to hit the asset and it's going to fail. There you see, it says main panicked something bad, which is actually the asset. Now, before we go on to use WinDebug, there is a built-in technique in which Rust can actually show the actual stack. So let's go ahead and do that. That's called a Rust backtrace. So in order to set the backtrace, all we have to do is we go up here and make sure that we have the environment and the std namespace included. And then what we do is we set a variable called Rust backtrace and we set it to one. You can actually set this in the shell so that when you run the application, you don't really need to modify, but I'm just going to set it in the code itself. Now, if I run the application, What's going to happen is when it does crash, it's going to show me a limited backtrace from the point where it crashed, the panic handler, and it's going to show me the lines where the crash occurred. And of course, it's going to show me the uh, message. Now, this output looks really good. But if we wanted to get more information, like for example, we want to look at the local variables, we want to look at what exactly happened in the asset. Um, it's a bit difficult. We can use WinDebug to do that. Let me switch over to WinDebug, which is waiting at the start of the application. Let's run the application and view the output. So the application is completed and the terminate process, that's the end of the application. And the output kind of looks like this, where the backtrace is over here and there has been a panic. Let me remove the output window over here. It's kind of blocking the screen. So we see that the application completed successfully, but there is an exception. This is the location in which the asset was triggered, and that is what is throwing this exception. In order to trap the exception, what we do is we just take the code, let's restart the application to the start. And then what we need to do is we need to do SXE, put the code that is to enable exception traps and then run WinDebug from this point. We can see that at this point, WinDebug has stopped on an exception. If I run KP, I can get the full stack that was previously enabled in the uh, backtrace, but the stack is much more deeper this time. From this backtrace, I can see that RTL user thread start is right at the bottom. This is correct because this is exactly where the application makes its thread. I can see that the main has run and I can also see that my func, the only function has panicked because it has called the panic uh, handler over here. This is the code that is added by the asset. I can see that the program actually starts from this location, but that doesn't really matter because this is the actual function that is running. If I click on the frame over here, 
I can actually get to the source code of the asset. Now at this point, we are at the frame that can actually see where the asset is. If I run dv, I will get a list of all local variables. This is one of the things you don't get when you do a backtrace. You can get it in Winnibug because Winnibug can actually look at the memory and it can actually show you the variables. So when I look at the local variables, I see that x can either be 6 or 5, but it cannot be 10. And that is the reason why this asset was triggered. The reason that there are two variables on the stack over here is because of a feature in Rust called shadowing. Now, the variable x has been declared once here, it has been modified and then declared again over here. This is why there are two instances. In order to see which one is actually the value in x, what we can do is we can run dv slash t slash v and we can actually see the memory address. The memory address which is lower is the variable that is declared later. Whenever shadowing occurs, it just adds another variable. Now the stack grows downwards, that's what happens. That's why the memory address for the first instance 6 is actually a value higher than the second address. Now if we really wanted to verify, we can actually look at the disassembly. Let me just grab the uh, disassembly window and put it in here. However, reading the assembly of Rust is very complicated. I don't want to overcomplicate this video, but this point over here is actually being generated by the asset. If we want to look at the comparer for the x, the value is actually a bit higher up here. It's a bit hard to find. It's actually a compare statement. Uh, it's over here. And the memory address is actually 68H. Um, we can't actually see this memory address anymore because the RBP register has actually moved in the intermediate point. But the technique that I've been using is that I just view the local variables and I just look at the address which is lower. That is the closest variable that is being shadowed to this line. At this point, if we don't want to repeat this debugging, we can actually capture a memory address with dump slash ma. All this works really fine. If you load the memory dump, it's just like any other native memory dump. Um, there is no difference between capturing a Rust memory dump and any other native application. Anyway, this is a quick video I wanted to make to show how to start debugging a crash from a Rust application using Windybug. My application has a lot of tests. So actually, I have not been using Windybug because my application has not been crashing. However, that's because I've been writing tests for nearly everything. However, if you do get a crash, Windybug can help. So I was a bit curious to see if you could take a memory dump and you can debug it exactly the same as any other application. Well, you can, except for shadowing, which is a bit more complicated. So I thought I'll make this video to just show that it is possible even with shadowing. Gentle reminder to subscribe, give a like and hit that bell icon to be notified of new videos. As always, it's been a pleasure bringing you this information. I am High Voice, signing out.